Okay, awesome. So hello everyone and thank you for being here with us today. Um, so we're gathering today in this digital space, but we are being hosted by the University of Michigan in Dearborn. The University of Michigan Dearborn sits on the territory of Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which is comprised of the Potowatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Odawa. So with this, we begin our program with the humble beginnings of an acknowledgement that hopes to honor the indigenous people on the lands um, with which the university currently resides. <clears throat> we do this to honor, to acknowledge, and to uplift the first people who stewarded these lands in the past and their descendants who continue to carry on their legacy in the present. To members of the indigenous community, please know that you are not forgotten. Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, hello, my name is Gerard Wheeler. Uh, I use he and him pronouns. And I am the Race, Ethnicity, Intercultural, and Intersectional Identities Program Manager at the Center for Social Justice and Inclusion here at U of M Dearborn. Um, and today, I'm happy, I'm glad that we're, we're, we can host Dr. O, um, who is able to illuminate the issues facing the disabled community um, and also speak about how disability intersects with other oppressed identities, which further compounds marginalization. Dr. O, I heard you speak at the DI Summit in October, um, and to kind of quote you loosely, you said that disability is something that can happen to anyone at any time, and it's not something that we as a society think about or discuss. Um, and so I found that statement to be profound, even though it really shouldn't be, because um, disability or it's, it's something that's everywhere. It's very prevalent in society, but we don't really talk about it. It's, but it had me thinking, and you know, I'm someone who's like, supposedly like on the DEI cutting edge. And I'm just like, oh, I've never really thought about it that way. Um, so that was really profound to me. Um, and so I'm, hope, I'm hoping that, I'm glad that we have you here and you're able to speak to some of these issues. Um, some other things that have been on my, my mind are um, a community of people who have found themselves disabled um, either after being infected with the coronavirus or from vaccinations. And so there's like a population of people who have found themselves um, sort of in like limbo because the CDC doesn't really, and their doctors don't really have guidance on like how to help people who are having like reverse effects after having COVID, but are sort of being left behind um, as we, as some of us are able to be vaccinated and boosted and kind of live our lives normally, if you will. And so that's just something that's also been interesting. And then another sort of interesting layer um, and I don't know if you're able to talk about this, but these are just some things that I've been thinking about, and I'm glad that you're here. Um, the war in Ukraine, uh, I'm sure we're, we're, we all are aware that it's happening. I saw an interview recently um, with the woman who had escaped from the eastern part of Ukraine. Um, and she was in the West, and she started some sort of social support group. Um, and she was interviewing on some show, and she was saying, like, I, I set up this group, and I have lots of people who are disabled, who are left behind in buildings where... Um, you know, electricity has been cut off. So there's people in wheelchairs on third floors who aren't able to get out. And they're saying, we need help. And this woman, like, she was clearly distraught. And she's like, I don't know what to do for this, this community of people. Um, and so just another layer of, like, how disability is not at the focus or forefront of discussion. Because I haven't heard anyone other than this one 10-minute interview where someone mentioned that. Um, so these are just things that have been on my mind and I'm really glad we're able to host you. But before we get to you, just a few housekeeping things. Um, the Q&A feature is active. So uh, members of the audience, please feel free to post your, questioning, your questions there. Um, secondly, the closed captioning feature is active. So if you need that, um, you should be able to access that. If not, please message us and we'll try to assist you. Um, thirdly, this, uh, this, this program is being recorded and we'll be posting it on the university's YouTube account for later viewing if you're unable to stay for the program. Um, and yes, please just use the Q&A uh, box for questions. And so now I will introduce Dr. O. Um, so Dr. Oluwafaranmi Okolami um, is the Director of Student Accessibility and Accommodation Services at the University of Michigan, where he oversees the Office of Services for Students with Disability, um, two testing accommodation centers and the Adaptive Sports and Fitness Program. He is also an assistant professor of family medicine, physical medicine and rehabilitation and urology at Michigan Medicine and an adjunct professor of orthopedic surgery at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Dr. O was born in Nigeria before immigrating to the US at a young age. 
He attended high school at Deerfield Academy and college at Stanford University, where he also ran track and field, serving as captain his last two seasons and achieving academic All-American recognition. Rec recognition. He then earned his MD from the University of Michigan before matching into orthopedic surgery at Yale. At the beginning of his three year, at, at the beginning of his third year, he experienced a spinal cord injury, paralyzing him from the chest down. After two surgeries and intense rehabilitation, he was blessed with some return of motor function and navigates the world, the world as a proud wheelchair user, managing the other long-term um, seat of incomplete cervical spinal cord injury. I'm sorry, I don't know what that word is. Um, he went on to earn a master's in engineering, science and technology entrepreneurship from the University of Notre Dame and completed his family medicine re residency at Memorial Hospital in South Bend, Indiana. He served on the St. Joseph County Board of Health, um, appointed by the then mayor, now current secretary of department, now the, now the current, sorry, sorry, now current Secretary of the Department of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, um, and is on the board of River City Challenge Athletes, a nonprofit supporting the area uh, area adaptive sports, sports teams. He was featured on Robin Roberts' Good Morning America series, Thriving Thursday, and has a, a catchphrase, Disabu disabusing disability trademark, hoping to demonstrate that disability does not mean inability. He is a member of the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society, receiving Michigan, Michigan Medicine's Distinguished Early Career Alumni Award in 2020, and was given the a Teacher's a Teacher Award um, by the Academy of Medical Educators. Nationally, he serves on the dis, he, he serves as a disability issues representative on the steering committee for the group on diversity and inclusion at the Association of American Medical Colleges, sits on the National Medical Association's. Council on Medical Legislation and was by the White House Office of Public Engagement um, to participate in the Health Equity Leaders Roundtable series dedicated to exploring perspectives around access to care. He was appointed to the America 250 Foundation Health and Wellness Advisory Council and speaks around the country on topics related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, including but not limited to creating a health system that is accessible to and inclusive, uh, inclusive of both patients and providers with disabilities and providing reasonable and appropriate accommodations for students with disabilities in higher education. He's been featured on CBS News, PBS NewsHour, NBC, N MSNBC's Good Morning Joe, and is passionate about adaptive, adaptive sports and fitness, striving to provide, to provide access to phys physical fitness and inclusive recreation and competitive sports for all. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. O and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard. I appreciate that introduction. As he said, I am Fermi Okamami. I go by Dr. O. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a young black man with brown skin, short black hair. I've got on a wooden bow tie, a blue checkered collared shirt with a blue blazer and a lapel pin. In my background, you can see some fake plants because I can't keep real ones alive. And you can't tell that I am a wheelchair user. And so I'm sitting in a manual frame wheelchair. Now, the first thing I like to start with when I talk to people is I say I don't like giving talks. Now, anybody that has ever heard me speak and Dr. You know, Compias is laughing now because I never said I don't like to talk. I just said I don't like giving talks. What I like to do is start conversations. So the hope is that for the first you know, 15, 20 minutes today, I will, I will start a conversation by giving a presentation about some of the things that were referenced earlier, and I will try to touch on those points. And then we'll open the floor for this to actually be a dialogue with some questions being asked and hopefully some conversation so that each of you can feel part of it. Because I tell people that if my voice is the only voice you hear today, I've done all of you a disservice. Because whether you knew it or not coming into this presentation, each of you has a connection to this topic. Each of you has your own thought or perspective or opinion about the things that were brought up. And so therefore, if I come in thinking I know what you need to hear, then I am the one that's making the wrong assumption. And so I think that we can engage in this discussion and conversation around a topic that should not be only prevalent or salient to a small group of people. It should be something that we all recognize the relevance to all of us. And I'm going to end with a poem by Maya Angelou that will hopefully encapsulate the reason why I think that this is something that's important to us all. So I'm going to kick it off. 
Hopefully you can see my slide there it says disabusing disability. And that is something that I coined trying to demonstrate that disability is not inability. I'm gonna address what may be somewhat of a little elephant in the room and say, that was an embarrassingly long introduction. And you know, there are times that I say, you know, I don't want people to read my entire bio. I don't want people to then feel as though I'm trying to pat myself on the back by hearing some of those things. But I will tell you that because of some of these multiply marginalized identities that I have as a disabled black immigrant Nigerian man, there are some times that, and this is where I'll be a little colloquial, I don't mind having people put a little respect on my name. So that is how I will start this conversation to show you all how honest and open and real I plan to be so that all of you feel very comfortable being honest and open and real as well. So I don't like a whole bio being read because I feel some type of way about wanting people to hear that. But unfortunately, there are times that people need to be reminded that people that look like me can have those degrees, can have those accolades, and deserve to have a seat at the table to then do the work that we're all trying to do. So without further ado, I will start with an image that I usually use to kick off these conversations. And while we're gonna leave this for discussion later on, I encourage you all to then put things in the chat if you feel so comfortable to speak about if you've ever seen this image used before. Now, many people have probably seen this image and in keeping with giving a visual description of things, which is what I tried to do, I will describe this image for those that cannot see this for whatever reason. So this is an image that has two sides to it. On the two sides, there are three people that are each trying to watch what appears to be a baseball game on the other side of the fence. Now, these people, I call them tall, medium, and short. As you're saying whether you've seen it before, please feel free to tell me the conditions under which you saw it, what you thought when you were shown it, what, what emotions this brought up, and what point people were trying to make as they used this slide. So to return, there are three people on either side. I call them tall, medium, and short. On the left side of the slide, the tall, medium, and short individuals are each standing on one wooden box. With that one wooden box, tall individual can see the game, medium individual can see the game, short individual can now not see the game over or through the fence. Under that side, it says the word equality. Now the other side, same three individuals, but now the boxes have been moved. The boxes have been moved such that tall individual is not on any box and can still see the game, medium individuals on one box and can see the game, and then shortest individuals now on two boxes and can now see the game. Someone put in the chat that they usually saw it first on the internet, and the point they were making was that it, things that making things fair doesn't mean that everyone has equal access to the things that they need, since some need more or less than others to succeed. Someone else saw it in class and online, and very rarely does it have the equity side. And then someone actually saw it in middle school over a decade ago. So now I use this slide to then begin the conversation because under that other side where now everyone can see the game and the boxes have been moved, the word equity is written. The point that people often try to make with this slide is that equity and equality are not the same thing. That equality means giving everyone the same thing, but equity means giving people what it is that they need to actually have access. Now, most of the time, people come to this from a positive standpoint, talking about how we want to give people access, how the goal is for people to see the game on the other side of the fence, right? But then other people say things like, well, this is a problem because the fence should not be there in the first place. And I want to see the image that has the fence taken down and under that side, it says justice, because that's what it should be. Why are we putting barriers in front of people in the first place? Now, some people are more confident than others and bold in the things that they say, and others hide behind their Twitter fingers in the internet. And I'll tell you that at one point, someone commented online and said, why don't those insert racial slur here, buy tickets like everyone else and watch the game from the inside? I'm gonna repeat that in case you missed it. Someone said, why don't those insert racial slur here, buy tickets like everyone else, and watch the game from the inside. Now I say this not to be jarring or controversial or difficult, but I say it because we don't often recognize that we can be looking at the same picture and seeing two very different things. And so if the goal is to use this slide to have a conversation about diversity, equity, equality, inclusion, access, if the goal of this is trying to then see how we can solve problems and we don't recognize that people see a different problem when they see this slide, we're never going to get to a point where we're going to then find solutions to those problems because we don't realize that we're fighting different problems when we're seeing the same picture. 
Now, this isn't actually me attempting to say that I'm going to tell you which side is right. I'm merely saying that this is an analogy to use in conversations that we have because we often don't even realize that we are talking about different problems in the first place. We all make assumptions that we're seeing the same picture and that by looking at the same picture, we see the same problems. Now, when talking about this in cartoon characters, it's much easier to then discuss moving boxes around, especially when the reality of the world actually looks more like this. Now, I've moved on to a third slide that now has an additional image, and under this side, it says reality. In the reality slide, the tall individual is now starting, standing on seven or eight boxes, many, many more than they need to see the game. Medium individual is still standing on their one box and can see the game. And now the shortest individual is standing in a box-sized hole. Now, what I didn't mention is that in the first iteration of these images, what people often say is, well, you know, I don't know why that tall individual had to give up their box for that short individual. If we're talking about allocation of resources, why did that person have to give theirs up? That person worked hard for that one box they had, and we don't know what the other person did. And so that's why when we talk about the reality slide, there are times when the resources are stacked up in this way, and there are the haves and the have nots. And the question is, whose responsibility is it to provide for the have not? Is it someone's responsibility that has multiple boxes to give up their box and give it for the person who is now standing in a box-sized hole? The question that people ask is, well, who and what happened to that person? What did they do to themselves to dig themselves into that hole? Now, I am the first to then say that in this conversation, I want you all to know that I do not think that I'm the first or the best or the only in any demographic group that I represent. And I recognize that at the same time, I can have certain privileges and I have certain things that have been created by prejudice around me. And so I know that based on some things that I did not do, I was born with certain boxes already underneath me. Being born into a family of physicians, being born a man, being born with a non-disabled body, I knew that that provided me with certain boxes. But then being born an immigrant into the country, the United States, being a Nigerian, being a person that then acquired a disability, that is a hole that has been dug before I had anything to do with it. So at the same time, those two truths can be the same, that there are certain prejudices that I experience, but there are certain privileges that I have. And so it's not as black and white as just moving one box to another space, but this is the way that we can have an analogy of what are the resources and how do we provide them to people. Now, there was a time that I showed this image and a softball player actually said, you know what, the fence is not there to keep people out. The fence is there to keep things in. You know, when I was growing up, there was a busy road on the other side of our softball field. And if that ball rolled out into the road, we put ourselves in harm's way, having to go get that ball every time. And everybody always loves hitting home runs and softball and baseball. And if we don't have a fence, we have no true way of marking what a home run is. But at the same time, we love people watching our games and we want more people to watch the game. And so if we knew that there were people on the other side of that fence that wanted to then participate, we could have found a way to make that happen. Whether we make the fence a chain link fence, whether we put up some sort of clear plastic wall, we could have still made a way that then people on both sides of the fence get what it is that they need. But the only way that we will ever achieve that is if we are actually listening to people on both sides of that fence. If we're actually valuing the thoughts and perspectives of people on both sides of that fence. Now, this does not mean that listening to someone on the other side of the fence means that they're allowed to harm you with the things that they say or do. Because it doesn't mean that every thought is safe. It doesn't mean that every action should be taken. But if we don't engage in conversation to at least understand the thoughts of the people on the other side of the fence, there are times that those actions will be taken regardless if we engage in conversation or not. And so therefore, if we're trying to work together to provide access, if we're trying to work together to then have an equal and equitable society for all that are in it, we need to make sure that we're actually hearing the voices and identifying the problems that exist. Now, at some point, people are saying, okay, what does this have anything to do with disability? And that's when I show this final slide. So this final slide is one that I feel as though allows the door to be open to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the most broadest of senses. Because in those first images, people looked at that and they assumed that it was all people of color. They also assumed that it was all individuals that were of able body. They also usually assumed that all those people were men. 
And so in this image, this image I like to use to try to then embark on this conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion, and then specifically with respect to disability. In this new image, we have the same sort of theme of individuals trying to watch a game on the other side of the fence. But in this, the individuals are represented by different skin tones to try to represent different race. There are different clothing styles and hairstyles, which my interpretation is attempting to represent different genders. And then they even have a wheelchair user, which is attempting to represent disability. I will acknowledge and admit that I did not recognize the, the rainbow in the top right corner until multiple months after using this. And I now say that that's also representing our LGBTQ population as well. So when I look at this, I say, who was being excluded from that first set of images? We were able to have lots of discussion and thoughts and opinions on those first images and talking about reallocation of resources, talking about prejudice and privilege, talking about access and opportunity, talking about different sides of the fence. But the entire time, there were certain populations of individuals that may have felt as though their interests were not being heard if that was the conversation that we had. And so this is just a reminder that we need to be intentional about looking around and seeing who is not in the building, seeing who does not have a seat at the table. And at times, it's not because the person is not capable or competent or qualified to have a seat at the table. It is that there's no ramp or lift or elevator to get them into the building to then get to the room that the door is not wide enough to let them in to get to the table in the first place. So that's how I then use this as a gateway into a discussion about disability. Because while we will all have our intersectional identities, while we will have the things that we need, while if you took that wood and gave me a box, my wheelchair using self would not have had any ability to get up on that box to see the game. But if you took that same wood and then built a ramp, that ramp would have then given me access, if allowing me to have access was what people wanted. Now I remind you of how I opened. It does not mean that everybody wants everybody else to have access all of the time. And so there will be people that will intentionally be trying to then prevent you from getting the access that you need, whether that be a box, whether that be a ramp, whether that be extended time, whether that be any other type of accommodation that you may need to have full access to what you're doing in your community. That does not mean that we're not able to then overcome those individuals. It means that we need to recognize that they are there. And there are some people that just do not understand. And if given the opportunity to understand, they would then provide that access. But there are others that understand fully, but still intentionally restrict access to people that they do not think belong there. Now to keep moving with the presentation, I will just give you a quick background. You heard what my story was, and these images are intentional to just show some of the different parts of my life when I was in college running track and field, how my physical feats of being an All-American track and field athlete were part of how I defined myself. Graduating from medical school there and jumping for joy with my diploma in my hands or not in my hands, having the diploma, that was another day of joy of graduating and demonstrating how my mental abilities were something I was going to be able to use. I had my family there of a beautiful Nigerian family with physicians and lawyers and, and all sorts of other professionals that were what I saw as my future. That was how I then judged myself. It's how others judged me. And I thought that I was going to make impact in this world. I thought I was going to be able to make a significant difference based on my physical and mental abilities. And then that changed when this happened. When I ended up having a spinal cord injury, which paralyzed me from my chest down with minimal use of my upper extremities, I then had to question, what contributions will I be making in this space? What are people going to see in me now that I live life as I said it on the other side of the stethoscope? As we talk about access to things, I then questioned, even though I was a physician that felt as though I knew about taking care of patients, I felt firsthand how our patients often feel when they do not have answers to the questions that they're trying to get when they're in the hospital. I could not put a fork to my mouth, do my own bowel or bladder management, roll over from side to side, and I felt completely helpless in a space that I already occupied. I was already in the field of medicine, that I was terrified based on the lack of information that I was being given. And this is not criticizing any of the individuals that have cared for me, it's just recognizing how inaccessible the world is and how even inaccessible the field of medicine is. Now, this is what I tell people that believe it or not, I've been a black man my entire life, but I've only lived on both sides of the stethoscope for the past eight. 
And when I tell people that I felt the most discrimination and marginalization over that past eight years is to not belittle the number of years that I have led as a black man. It's only to acknowledge the fact that people can now literally and figuratively keep me out of the building and away from the table by a lack of accessibility. I felt as though my Deerfield, Stanford, Michigan, Yale, and Notre Dame degrees were enough to overcome the holes people tried to dig for me on the basis of immigrant status and race. But the barriers that people can put in front of you on the basis of disability are things that are much harder to overcome. And so we talk about intersectionality, which is often used inappropriately. People use the word intersectionality when they're truly trying to talk about diversity and people that have intersectional identities. So intersectionality, as defined by Kimberly Crenshaw, is actually a framework. It's a framework that recognizes not even just the additive, but the exponential discrimination and marginalization that occurs of people that are part of more than one marginalized identity group. It is talking about how a Black woman in a space will be treated and the ills that will come to her on the basis of race and gender. It's talking about how a disabled queer person will also have their multiple marginalized identities impacting the access they have to those spaces. So intersectionality is not merely recognizing that we have different identities. Intersectionality is recognizing the compounded nature that marginalized identities will have on the prejudice, the isms, the racism, the sexism, the misogynistic behaviors that people will then have against that person. So as I said, the goal here was to just talk for about 25 to 20 minutes to then sort of start the framework, but I want to make sure to touch on some of the things that Gerard brought up earlier as well. So in terms of how I felt the health system worked, I talked about the boxes in the beginning of this presentation and then the ramps that we could have. This image here is two sides of an image of me in my standing frame wheelchair, which is one of the accommodations that I was provided, one of the tools or resources that at that time I felt allowed me to get back into medicine. On one side, I'm looking at a slide in the OB unit diagnosing a woman with ruptured membranes that her water had broken. On the other side, I'm about to then do a cardiac catheterization where we put a wire in someone's artery to then go look at their heart. And this standing frame chair is what I felt gave me access to being able to do so. Now, this is just one tool that if people did not know about, I may not have been able to get the access to then contribute in that space in the way that I knew I could. And so then I ask, what other types of things are we keeping from people to allow them to fully participate? What other things are keeping people out of the buildings, out of the rooms and away from the tables where their contributions will be meaningful? So once again, I tell this story from the perspective of just one individual. And when you've met one person with a disability, I say you've met one person with a disability. And so that's why it's important for this to then turn into a conversation and not a monologue of Dr. O saying that this is how you treat Black people, this is how you treat Black men, this is how you treat disabled people. That is not the point of this. The point of this is to recognize the perspectives on different sides of the fence, to acknowledge that some of these things such as ableism and racism are systemic constructs that I am not pointing a finger at you and saying you are racist. But if we fail to acknowledge the impact that racism has had on our world, if we fail to acknowledge that it is a systemic construct upon which things were built that still has implications today, even if we say that was the past, I tell people that the past may not be our fault, but that the future will be. So what is it that we are going to then do when we recognize that we can make somebody's tomorrow better than their yesterday? Because even if we didn't have anything to do with the holes that were dug for an individual, if we have access to resources that we can then give to allow them to have more access to spaces, especially as we look at this in education and in healthcare, the goal is to then provide access and education and opportunity. And so therefore, if that is what the uniform goal is for all of us in these spaces, then we should then see that we can leverage the resources that exist to provide access for all. And this is an important point to bring before we start to go to Q&A and then allow people to participate. But I talk about this from the landscape of visible physical disability. I make it very clear that not all disabilities are visible. And so therefore, if we still live in a space that does not have the baseline physical accessibility that people need to have access, think about how much more inaccessible that would be for an individual with a disability that is not seen. And no one should have to disclose 
that they have a disability in order to then get access. Because if we live a world that recognizes the human experience and the diversity of the lived experience that we all have, we should be intentionally creating processes and procedures and establishments that are universally accessible. Because what that says is that we know you are there and we want you here. But if we do not have universal design for learning, if we do not have universal access to physical spaces, that is whether it's intentional or unintentionally telling people, we don't want you here. We don't want you to watch the game. We don't want you to have access. We don't want you to then enjoy this thing that we're also enjoying because of whatever reason it is. Whether we think that you are not capable or competent or qualified, the number of times that people have said directly to me, Dr. O, oh, with all due respect, I'm sure you can understand. I just want the best doctor possible. And if my doctor can't even take care of themselves, then how are they going to take care of me or my child? And I will say that this is where healthcare has fallen very, very short, is that if we have created this dynamic that people think that doctors are perfect and people think that doctors are without their own flaws, depending on how cheeky I'm feeling that day, I will tell people that the disability that you see in me is what you should probably take. Because the thing that someone might be hiding somewhere that you don't know about their life is that thing that could really then end yours. And so I think that we have to recognize once again, the diversity of the lived experience and that doctor and patient is no different. One is not better than the other. We are all just part of this human experience in this continuum, which makes it such that no one person is better than the other. So I will continue to say that the goal of what we've been trying to do here at the University of Michigan in our work is my goal in terms of how do we address this big problem that we're talking about of racism, ableism, all these isms. And I had to decide, I want to then reframe what it is that I do and the contributions I can make. Because we each have a role in what we can do within our spheres of influence. And so I gave you a bit of my background to then have you understand some of the things I was passionate about in sport is one of those things that I've always been doing throughout my life. And sport does much more than then just create a team for you. Sport does much more than provide you with physical health and wellness. The emotional that portion of health and wellness is also part of this. Growth and development, teamwork, camaraderie, respect and responsibility. All of these are things that come through access to sport. And whether you want to play a team sport or not, these are things that as you go through school, people get access to. So our goal now is to then take this little sphere of influence and re reconceptualize what equitable opportunities are. So we talk about adaptive sports here, which are not sports just for people with disabilities, but there are sports that allow people with disabilities to participate together with everyone. And so we talk about the adaptive sports and fitness program we have at the University of Michigan as just one example of that. And very briefly, I'll give the overview. We have our adaptive sports and fitness student group, which is made of students with and without disabilities, advancing the work of adaptive sports and fitness in our community. We've got our prescription to play grant, which was funded by the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation to then embed adaptive sports education and equipment in the healthcare systems so that physicians and clinicians will be able to tell their patients, no matter what it is they're coming in the door with, that adaptive sports exist. We have our adaptive sport and inclusive recreation initiative where we have embedded adaptive sport curriculum in the PE programs of the Ann Arbor Public Schools so that this year and on, every single sixth grader at least will then get to play adaptive sports, wheelchair tennis, wheelchair basketball, para, uh, goal ball, ambulatory, uh, sorry, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair tennis, goal ball, seated volleyball, adaptive fitness and adaptive yoga are the six curricular items that every single student, not just students with disabilities, will be doing in our public schools. And then, as I said, not everyone likes sports. And so our adaptive fitness component is providing equitable access to accessible equipment, equipment for people to engage in physical fitness. Our competitive sports are then there, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair tennis, ambulatory track and field, and para equestrian. So to give you a little introduction into what this is, I think I clicked my sound, but I'm gonna stop and then make sure that the sound is being shared, so you can all hear it. So let me share this with you. This is an introduction into our curriculum. Very short, less than two minutes. Today, we're going to learn about adaptive sports and inclusive recreation. We all have different abilities. Some people don't need glasses to see. Some need glasses, and some cannot see. Some people are born with long legs, short legs, and some are born without legs. 
We have to remember that we're all different in our own way. While some of us look different and have different abilities, the similarity we all share is our love of being active. Participating in physical activity, like team sports, makes us healthy, helps us perform better at school, and is an opportunity to make friends. Just like you need skates for ice hockey, cleats for soccer, or a bicycle for cycling, some adaptive sports may require equipment, like a sports chair for wheelchair basketball or wheelchair tennis. The sports chair is different from other wheelchairs you may have seen before. It's designed for speed and performance. Some sports may not require specialized equipment, like sitting volleyball. And some sports are new altogether and introduce us to fun new ways to include people of all abilities, like goalball. With adaptive sports, we can include everyone so we can all enjoy sports and recreation together. So that was just a little introduction into what every single one of those students will first see in their class. And then we will allow them to then participate in these sports. And we've already been getting great feedback from the school system about how this is already starting to achieve our goal of destigmatizing disability. Because if you then see your classmates playing a sport together with you, that you're all learning together, you don't see that sport chair as a medical device. You don't see your classmate as ill or sick or dirty in some way. And you see that they're not much more different than you are. And so if we can start to then affect change at the sixth grade level, we may have people that are not that individual that is saying, why don't those insert racial slur here, buy tickets like everyone else? Because if we're able to then start teaching our children that we are more alike than we are different, if we start to recognize that difference does not mean less than, if we start to show people that disability doesn't mean inability, they will then become adults that don't perpetuate that same thing. The goal is to expand it to other districts as well. We, you know, we applied for a grant and the first grant that we applied for was to do it in five different counties all across Michigan. And they essentially said, you're a little too big for your britches, but how about you start small? And so then we wrote the grant a second time and wrote it just for Ann Arbor Public Schools within a sort of a, an area that we could absolutely control the resources and we've gotten wonderful reviews. So the goal is to actually make this curriculum open to everyone, right? The barrier at times is equipment. And not every single one of those sports needs additional equipment to then be able to play. And so we have these multiple sport packages that are rotating around the Ann Arbor Public Schools now, such that after we are done, the Ann Arbor Public Schools will be the ones then responsible for making sure that they can incorporate that in their curriculum. And then we will go off and try to continue sort of embedding this in places all around the state and then the country, because there are no consistent standards for what students should have in their PE programs that are across all 50 states. So that is our goal there. Now quickly to wrap up so we can have some time for Q&A and discussion. Here is a, just some images of our program. We've got our wheelchair tennis team who in our first year of competition last year in the midst of the pandemic, were able to go down to Orlando, Florida and we took second in the nation at the wheelchair tennis national championships. And then our next image here, we've got uh, one of our student athletes playing in our first ever wheelchair basketball tournament that was hosted here at the University of Michigan. This is Mr. Spencer Heslop, number 24, who is a graduate student completing his master's in epidemiology. And he actually went to college at University of Illinois where he played wheelchair basketball. And while he was one of our rock stars on the wheelchair tennis team and went undefeated in the national championships last year, he will unfortunately not be able to attend wheelchair tennis nationals with us in a few weeks this year, but that is because he's invited to join the Team USA Paralympic National Team tryouts. So he will be going to try out for the national team for Paralympics for basketball and will not be able to then participate in the wheelchair tennis program. And then last but not least, we've got here Mr. Sam Grew, who he is a gold medalist in the high jump at this past Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games. And he's also a first year medical student here at the University of Michigan. So the goal for this is just to give a few examples of the opportunities that exist and how without a program like this at the University of Michigan, we would not be able to then recruit and retain talented individuals that can continue to demonstrate that disability does not mean inability. Now, this is not to say that athletes are the only ones that can do that. By no means is that my goal. This is just one explanation for a group of students that have been able to start to then make that sort of mark on our institution and recognizing that there are plenty of students with disabilities that are doing amazing work outside of athletics as well. 
But I know the place that where my bread is buttered at this institution and knowing that an institution that loves academics and loves athletics to see talented student athletes like this representing the institution will hopefully lead us to a place where we get additional resources for all other students with disabilities as well. Because as an athlete at a division one institution, I can speak very directly about the fact that the number of boxes that are stacked up under our athletes at times are disproportionate as compared to the rest of our population. And if we can at least start to demonstrate that we have a population of students living with disability that we are not resourcing appropriately, and my colleague Sarah here in the office at Dearborn as well can then attest to that, our institutions are trying to do the best that they can but I can acknowledge that while we have done a lot, we still have a long way to go to then reach the level of where the ADA that was instituted 31 years ago at this point, the ADA is merely the floor and there's so much more that is needed to provide equitable access. The ADA being the Americans with Disabilities Act that is supposed to provide protections for people living with disabilities in this country. And so the goal is not just to have the ADA achieved, the goal is to make sure that everybody can have equitable access to the same experience. So I told you I was going to end with something that will hopefully encapsulate this vision for disability, for race, and for any other marginalized identity. And it's a poem by Maya Angelou, and I will read it to you briefly and then open up for questions. It's called Human Family. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived as true profundity and others claim they really live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse, bemuse, delight. Brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mirror twins are different, although their features jibe, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. We love and lose in China, we weep on England's moors, and laugh and moan in Guinea, and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine, in minor ways we differ, in major we're the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, fascinating talk. Uh, Every time I'm attending one of your talks, uh, I can uh, I learn something new, and today was no exception. I understand that there should be some uh, student interest uh, to uh, throw you some questions at you. I will uh, start with uh, only a subset of uh, those uh, that I had in mind. So um, you talked about the uh, U of M. So just uh, following up on that discussion, how accessible have you found the U of M campus for someone who uses a wheelchair? And how does it compare to other university settings you might you have been in? So, as I told you, being a straight shooter always, but also being sensitive to uh, not bite the hen that feeds me, I think that it is clear to most that most of our establishments around the country at this point, especially ones that are as old as the University of Michigan that existed before the ADA, have certain spaces that are not as accessible as they should or could be. So I will say that we actually have been recently done a project which is mapping sort of accessible routes on our campus to then, and actually I think it just went live yesterday, to then be able to show what accessible paths do exist. Now clearly accessibility means much more than just physical. And so talking about having wheelchair access on your campus is just one step to achieving accessibility for the disability community. And so I would say that the University of Michigan, I'd say across all of our campuses, which is one thing we try to do, is recognize that as we do work as the University of Michigan, I truly want us to be the University of Michigan and not just the University of Michigan and Arbor campus. Because oftentimes when we talk about the university, people fail to recognize that we have two campuses that are not in Ann Arbor. So the University of Michigan as a whole is all three of our campuses. 
And I'm looking forward to then working with my partners across these other three campuses to be able to then collaborate and sort of bring resources together in a way that demonstrates that we value our students, faculty and staff and community members with disabilities the same way as our non-disabled community members. So in short, I think that we are trying to acknowledge the inaccessibility of some of these spaces. There are plans to try to then address the things that are not accessible. And as this compares to other institutions, I think every institution is struggling with this in some way. It's just that not all of them are acknowledging the fact that this is something that they need to do. So just ignoring it doesn't make it better. But I will say that given that we are a minoritized population and by definition, we are small in number based on who discloses they have disabilities, institutions have not always prioritized accessibility as something that is of the utmost importance because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And unfortunately, if you're not wheeling around campus squeaking, sometimes they don't know that you're there. Thank you. Uh, and then the, I'm sure everyone in the call agrees uh, uh, with uh, your uh, earlier uh, comments about the broadening the perspective of uh, your innovations uh, to other campuses. So um, <clears throat> if you could just uh, narrow in on one challenge that uh, you might be facing in your daily life that someone who's not using a wheelchair might not think about, uh, which would be the one um, key challenge that uh, you'd like to uh, bring to everyone's attention? So for my daily life, you know, and, and I talk about the prejudice and the privilege, and I will then acknowledge that I have certain things in place that have made it such that my life may not be as significantly impacted by being a wheelchair user than others may think, right? And that's the first thing I actually like to offer people is that someone who operates living their life in a wheelchair does not need pity, right? And I'm not saying that's what you're asking by any means, but I do think it's an important thing to remind people because most often, and sometimes we are sick, and just like everybody gets sick, sometimes we are sick, but disability is not synonymous with sick. And so that does not mean that when you see somebody living their life, wheeling around life all day long, that you need to put your hands on the back of their wheelchair and push them. And so I tell people that asking someone if, you, if they need help is perfectly fine. But when that individual tells you that they don't need your help, they are not being rude or angry or just an ornery, disabled, old, young, black person, right? And this is direct commentary that I have been given at times. Because for some reason, the assumption people make is that we need help. The assumption that they make is that our life must be so difficult that it must just suck to then have your life. And I tell people that no, every single one of us deals with something on a day-to-day -day basis with or without a disability. And so I'm not shirking your question, but I'm saying that I think that I wanna take this opportunity to say that while I may have things in my life that are difficult on the basis of being a wheelchair user, I don't know that that makes my life more difficult than someone who is struggling with things that I may not see. So I use this as a way to then say that every one of us likely has something that makes our life difficult. And if we can acknowledge that, if we can have the cultural humility to know that there may be things we don't understand in other people's lives and we engage in that conversation with everyone, goes back to the beginning of this presentation. If we talk to people, if we learn about what barriers are in front of them, and if we strive to then create access for everyone, we will start to learn that, as I said earlier, everyone can use the ramp while not everyone can use the stairs. And so if we start to then create more ramps for people that create that universal accessibility, we will find that the parent pushing a stroller, the male person delivering with the dolly, or the individual that's a wheelchair user or on a walker will then have access to the space. So are there things that on the basis of being a wheelchair user every single day I encounter? Absolutely. Does that make my life any more difficult than someone who has other difficulties in theirs? Not necessarily. And so I think that you know, the, the goal for me would not be to highlight the, the physical inaccessibility of my life, because as me and an N of one, I have a lot of privileges that have made it such that that has not significantly impacted me now. I have multiple different types of wheelchairs, power chairs, manual chairs. I have these cool scooters I use to get around. I have support with staff that then, you know, do a lot of the things in the offices that I'm in now that if I were on my own, I'd have difficulty doing, right? I've got people that help me change light bulbs in my house because changing a light bulb that's up in your ceiling is not the easiest thing to do when you need a ladder, right? I travel often and my wheelchair gets damaged almost every single time I travel. So that's not a minor sort of insignificance in my life. And that's a privilege that I have, however, because given that I have multiple chairs, I can use another chair when something gets damaged. So 
by no means do I want to then paint my life picture as a wheelchair user as devastating, but I do want to highlight the fact that as you know, Gerard brought up earlier, you know, there are individuals that not just in Ukraine, but right down the street here may be stuck in buildings that when an emergency happens and you then shut off the elevator and tell people to use the stairs, how are you going to get the student faculty staff out of that upstairs room where they are now stuck? We need to have plans in place so that we recognize that we are going to have disabled people in these spaces. And we have all sorts of other tornado drills, earthquake drills, and now God forbid, even active shooter training, that if we do all these things and don't recognize that disabled body minds are in those spaces as well, then we're doing a disservice. Thanks, uh, this is uh, very helpful. And uh, I was hoping uh, the response would be along those lines. Um, I would like to go to a, a question from the audience. Um, someone is asking how should we approach or what tips do we have for being disabled uh, or able friendly in your daily life? Yeah, so this is another, and, and please feel free to challenge me if people feel, feel like I'm sort of skirting questions. But I think that with respect to disability specifically, it goes back to recognizing that we don't always have all the answers. And so the first thing I say to my students, to anyone is, if you want to know how to help someone, there's nothing wrong with asking right? Now, you may have different responses from different people based on what experiences they've had in their life. And so if you take that with a grain of salt, but that's the type of thing that you will get to do to then learn what people may need. And some people may say, I don't want you to help me. Some people may say, well, if you did this, that would be very helpful. But to be more disability friendly in our daily lives, I could think of a couple of tangible things to do. When I said that the past may not be our fault, but the future will be, Think about the places that you enter on a regular basis and look for where the accessible entrances are or aren't. And then if you frequent this establishment regularly, you can then ask them, have you ever had someone that's a wheelchair user enter this space? How do they get in and out? I don't feel as though that you, I, I haven't seen a ramp or an elevator and there are stairs to get into this building. So not doing it in a litigious way, but just merely asking a question because when you bring that up, you're not the angry disabled person that is trying to get in. You are just a concerned citizen that recognizes the fact that some one of your other concerned citizens might not be able to have access. Because when I think about things that we call the minority tax, when the demographic group that is the one that's marginalized is the only one speaking out about the injustice, when women are the only ones fighting for equal pay for gender, when people with disabilities are the only ones asking to uphold the ADA, and when people of color are the only ones screaming about anti-Black racism, it then makes it seem like those things only impact the people that are in those demographics. And so when we talk about the human family, when I talk about our spheres of influence, we'll recognize that we have intersecting Venn diagrams of those spheres. And there will be things that then those intersectional identities will then make it such that you are not just advocating for that population and you're not doing it because you worry that you may be disabled one day too, it's the fact that if there's an injustice to one, that's an injustice to all. And so our goal should be, what can we do in our day-to-day -day lives to recognize inaccessibility? And it doesn't always mean directly helping the disabled person. It might mean that you can then identify inaccessibility in the world in which you are in, and you are the one that then takes steps to make sure that things are more accessible. Thank you. Um, I This is a great response and something for everyone to uh, take home. Uh, there's another question about uh, individuals with uh, um, chronic or, or terminal disabilities like MS. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, to what extent, uh, if someone would have, uh, to what extent uh, someone could be left uh, bed bound? Um, and uh, it seems that the standing chair is a relatively new development, um, which also leads to the other question I had about technological innovations that uh, you think might be uh, uh, able to uh, support us like telehealth, but uh, I'll uh, stop there. So yes, that, that is a great question. And I, as I do with most things, I'm gonna point something out first that I am not being critical of the person that asked the question, merely helping with some terminology that some of us feel. So and I, I saw you put them in, in quotes, and so perhaps that's because that's what someone else used, but bed bound and wheelchair bound are phrases that at least for me, I tend to stay away from because I tell people I am not bound by or to my wheelchair. I'm actually liberated because of it. If I did not have a wheelchair, that would prevent me from being able to get around in the spaces that I get around now. 
And so I tell people that my wheelchair is not my limitation. My wheelchair is not the problem. The fact that my legs don't work like other people's isn't the problem. The fact that we don't have spaces that are accessible for people who get around in different ways is. So that's just one thing. Try to avoid the term wheelchair bound or bed bound, right? And I say I'm a wheelchair user. Now, yes, the standing frame wheelchair is one of the technologies, one of the innovative things that has allowed me to be able to do the things that I do, but this is gonna be this sort of speaking out of both sides of my mouth. There is a, a national disability advocate, her name is Judy Human, who if you haven't heard of the movie Crip Camp, C-R-I-P, Camp, C-A-M-P, look it up, watch it. It's an amazing movie. The Obama's actually executive produced it as well. And it is an amazing movie about sort of disability rights movement. And I tell people that Judy Human is to sort of black civil, sorry, Judy Human is to disability rights as Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King combined are for black civil rights because she has literally moved the needle to then increase accessibility. And she's one of the main protagonists of this movie. I bring her up because I have a sort of a, a film that's being made on me right now and I let her watch part of it. And she said, you know what, Fermi, if I didn't know you before watching this, I don't know if I would have wanted to. Because in this, there's all this macho huffing and puffing and walking stuff. And while it's great that you were able to regain some function, while it's great that you have this standing frame wheelchair, what image are you then giving other people that then either lost an ability to walk and never regained it or were born without an ability to walk? You are perpetuating this ableist mindset that being upright and standing is the norm that we all need to strive for, rather than pushing for the fact that people that sit should be able to have just as much access. You shouldn't have had to need a standing frame wheelchair to get access to return to medicine. And there are plenty of physicians and surgeons that do not use standing frame chairs to then get their work done as well. So while there are medical benefits to having a standing frame chair, like pressure release and, and, and bearing weight in your bones, I wanna make sure that that is not then being seen as the ideal because you're trying to get closer to an able-bodied norm of then standing. There are medical benefits that then people can get for bearing weight. And there might be physical benefits in being able to access certain things, but making sure we recognize that having access for everyone, no matter what their disability or ability is, is what we strive for, rather than pathologizing whatever the disability is that people have and making them feel like they are the problem, right? So we are not the problem in our disabled body minds. It's the fact that the structural places that we enter were not made with us in mind. And therefore we need to change the systems to recognize that guess what, we're here and we're not going away. And if you ever actually wanna be even more direct, based on healthcare, we're extending life for people so that we'll have more people on the older end of the spectrum that then fall into this category of people living with disabilities as well. And do we not want to provide equitable access for them also? And then you remember the people that are at the other end of the age spectrum who will still have disabilities for their entire lives. We do not want to create a world in which they already feel as though they are less than on the basis of not being able to access everything else their peers do by no fault of their own. And I thank you for the, the answers to that question and just for this information overall. I have the unfortunate position of just looking at the time here and wanting to make sure that I know that some of our participants might have um, you know, other commitments at two o'clock. So I just want to take a minute here um, you know, to, to just thank everybody uh, for choosing to join us this afternoon. Um, and thank you to those who've been able to stay. Uh, we do hope that you found this program helpful for your own personal journey towards realizing a more accessible and equitable society. Um, I am definitely more than willing to stand online if there's more questions. I just want to be able to make sure that you know, we, we kind of just have a moment to thank you, you know, for coming and, and talking with us and sharing your experiences and your knowledge as well. Um, I always love listening to you talk and getting to be able to talk just as another director um, of an office in higher education and all the different things that we face here. Um, so I will, I will mute myself too if there are other questions that people have, but those that do need to step off, again, thank you for coming. Yeah, I wouldn't like to uh, take uh, too much uh, of uh, the time over the scheduled time, but uh, any if there are any uh, remaining questions, I have uh, at, shared all of uh, the ones I had. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience. Um, so I would like to uh, also thank uh, uh, Dr. Okolami for finding the time to uh, share his uh, unique perspective. And uh, I see there was uh, a lot of 
many uh, enjoyed the conversation as I have uh, in the past. So thanks, uh, Fermi, for this great talk. Thank you all for having me to all of the organizations that sort of collaborated to bring this to fruition. And I do want to, to call out, we've got Sarah and Judith on the call for the amazing work that they're doing up there as well. So please make sure to support your own disability services office, because if you want to know how then you can improve the communities in which you are in, please connect with them because I'm sure they will have opportunities for places that you can plug in also. My email is my last name. I'll put it in the chat right now for the person that asked. And I'm sure it could be sent out afterwards. So I, I also have a 2 p.m. So I want to be sensitive to the time also and say thank you very much for having me and looking forward to continuing this conversation since that's what this is. This is not the end and we work together. So we'll continue to do the work together. Thank you very much.